Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. Boom on. Yeah. What does that mean? That's just what I say at the start. Oh, sorry. Boom yeah. on. Boom we're on. Oh, boom we're on. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got boxing legend one. Frank yeah. Bruno. How are yes. you, Frank? Very, very good, James. Mustn't grumble. Very good. First Happy. and foremost, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show. No problem. Thanks for inviting us. Absolute honour. Boxing legend. All right, cheers. Over 40 fights. World champion. Fought the greatest of all time. Like, Unbelievable achievements for where you've came from to what you've done in life. I take my hat off to you, brother. Thank you very much. You're very kind of you. You're making me blush <laughs> before we started. <laughs> but I always go back to the start with my guest, Frank. Uh, where you grew up and how it all began. Where I grew up? Yeah. I was born in Hammersmith. Um, when I was three, I moved. my mum moved to Wandsworth. So I was brought up in Wandsworth um, area. How was that? It was very not too bad. I got um, three sisters, two brothers, and I'm the youngest out of the family, so I got spoiled. Even if I had a fight or something, I've got big brothers to run to. I say my big brother would sort you out if I couldn't sort them out. But yeah, I had a good fun. How was school? Um, dyslexic, very, very hard in different ways. But when I went to the ball stool, I had special teachers, look, not special, but teachers, you know what I mean, trying to get you into your mind and find a, a routine to do. But yeah, school was good. And what sort of school I needed, the ball stool. How did you how did you end up in Boston? Um, my mum warned me if I don't start fighting and getting into trouble on the street, she'd send me to the ball, ball stool. But I didn't really realise until I got to twelve what it was really really like. But it's a good place, you know. Learning look after yourself very early on because someone nick a cake or trying to rub you or nick a cigarettes or whatever. Very serious place. Do you find you were fighting a lot more because you were dyslexic? Was people trying to tease you? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. So um, in boarding school with about um, 200, 100 kids, the sarcastic and trying to whine the bullies and whatever, yeah. You have the stages, what you go through in, in the ball school. Same like if you're in prison, if you know someone in there who can look after you, it's, it's nice. Not a bad place. Yeah, I had a man on the podcast as well called Yami B. He spent over 40 years in prison, but he spent time in Boston with Chris Eubank. Did he? Okay, yeah. yeah. Chris right. Eubank was the same, just kind of fighting his whole life. Do you think yeah. the fighting was a getaway for yourself as well? I don't really know, you know what I mean? I always wanted to be a boxer because I sussed it out really that I couldn't be a footballer because I was very, very clumsy. I tried all different sports, but boxing is what I loved. I loved doing karate and boxing when I was a youngster. And what? I always admire Bruce Lee as well. What age did you start boxing? About eight, nine, um, 11, 12. I had three junior fights, one, two, lost one. But I just got hot, sent off to um, the Bulls at that time. Is that when you started finding a passion for it straight away from a uh, young age? Yeah, try, you know, I was wondering what I'm going to do. You t talk to your mates and they're going <laughs> to... One wants to be a bank robber. This one wants to be a designer. <laughs> this one wants to be a football agent. And I wanted to be a boxer. And sometimes I see the guys, some of them have done very well for themselves, but some of them are dead, unfortunately. Yeah, that's My a scary thing. Par Parker, you good boy. Does that play a lot in your mind now? No, nah, it's not filling my mind. Just before I'll drop it in the, in the conversation. Yeah. So when you started training the boxing, do you remember your first fight? Yeah, I do remember my first sparring session as well. I got the I was, um the sparring session was a um a policeman, Southport, very awkward so and so. Took me down the gym, he beat me up for a couple of days, a couple of 
gym, times I went down the gym, very, very awkward, dangly. He beat me up. But the third time I went down there, I uh, learned the little tricks here and there, and they took me on the Levitons, Gary Leverton, and his dad was John Leverton. Good guys. What was it like from fighting on the streets to fighting in the ring? Did you see it totally night and day? It's very, very different. You know what I mean? I learned to fight a little bit on the street, but in the street, you've got to head, but bite, do whatever you've got to do, but boxing, you've got to drop it diplomatically with the fist, you know? How did your friends treat you when you started going into, going to a boxing gym? Who? Your friends? Some of them were very odd towards me. Some of them wouldn't talk to me because they felt, I don't know, I've never changed. You know what I mean? Never will change, but some of my friends change towards me. Is that because they think you're maybe leaving them behind in some degree? Not, but I don't know. It's freaky when you see your friend on... If I had a friend and he was on television doing bits and pieces, I would find it kind of odd. But some of them don't want to... Not really don't want to speak to me. They, they're weirdly shy. Were you scared for your first sparring session? No, nah, I weren't scared. I was a sparring session for the um, the policeman. Then I got involved in going down to George Francis Gym in North North London, and I had a chance to fight spar with like Mawali. I was his um, chief sparring partner or his bitch that he could beat me up and <laughs> set me like a, <laughs> like a puppy. You know what I mean? But yeah, for about a couple of years, I was his sparring partner, punch bag actually. But he was a good guy, like Mawali, very underestimated, but he came from Zambia before he was born. Your dad might know him, or this or that man might know him, but yeah. a long time before he was born. See, when you're getting beat up, did that ever give you any incentive to try and quit because you thought it was maybe too much? No, or did you enjoy it? you've got to take a little beating. I'm not kinky, but my dad, if I was out of order, he would drop some mans on it. Now, if he'd done it in this day and age, he'd be locked up with the curtain wire and whatever. But that's old school for you. What was your first amateur fight? Um, first amateur junior fight was a, a guy from Battersea. remember it very well. We fought three fights. I won two. And he, he, he won one. Did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it because his dad was winding me up. I think he was a um, borderline gypsy guy and he did, didn't like me at all. And he, his son, obviously, he wanted his son to beat me, but his son never beat me. I beat him. And he, he, I got two and he got one. What was it like winning your first fight? It was a good, good buzz, good feeling. You know, I mean, nerve wrecking when you go in the ring, you know, because you may think that you're a bad boy out of the ring, but when ding, ding, round one comes, it's a different cup of tea. So when you start doing well in boxing, see outside the ring, do people try and test you? All the time. I've got a detached retina at market, um, market not too far from there. Some gypsy kid come up to me, hit me in the butt, head me in, head butt me, sorry. So he was headbutt me in the eye and then tore my retina. But certain different things, if you're in the celebrity world, you got to expect all that, that, that yeah. sh you know what I mean? Shit, what comes with it. How did you handle that at a very young age? Like, because your first, is it 21st fights? You were yeah, 21 yeah, yeah, knockouts? Yeah. I listened to Terry Lawless. He's a very, very wise English guy and very constructive to not only set you, you, you out to fight, how to spar, how, where to go, but he's talking about after you finish from boxing, that still moves on. And he told me that very young, and I stuck with it, you know? What age did you turn professional, Frank? What age? Borderline 19. So you never had many amateur fights, did you have? Three amateur fights, senior amateur fights, 21. Won all of them. The guy lost one. The guy that beat me, I had to go to Dublin to go and fight him, Joe Crystal. Very, very tough family, but I got my revenge on that one. What was that like, getting that defeat? It, it was um, sad because um, if I was to listen to kept going and keep fit in the gym and do the, the right things, but the, the second time I fought him, I did do the right things and train very, very hard for the fight and focus and I done a, done a job on him. So that's not a lot of amateur fights before you turn professional. But what was the decision to turn professional at a younger age? I uh, met a young lady and she got pregnant by me. So when my mother gave me a week to get out of the house and find myself um, somewhere where to go. But I, had, I went to America for three months and I left the wife to organise the sale of the house and move and all that different bits and pieces. Was that when you started sparring with Mike Tyson? Um, when I went over to America, borderline that was, yeah, yeah. What was that like? Was he 15, he was 16, you were 19? He was very, very good. We had about four different sparring partners, Jeff Sims, James Creek Tillis, um, Joe Frazier's son, or his grandson, was one of the sparring partners, and Tyson. We all mingled together and 
trying to knock the shit out of one another. And it was a good session, good time spending around Tyson Fury. Good time because Customado was a very beautiful, very knowledgeable guy about boxing. And you sit down and have lunch with him, have tea with him, and he would tell you so many different lyrics. Very, very professor, I'll call him, of boxing, knowledgeable. Yeah, did you learn a lot from Custom? No, even sitting down eating, every minute he's firing off lyrics by their common sense, just like your dad or your uncle or your grandma. You sit down in the room with your grandma at the table, your grandma would be the head of the table and she'd be throwing out some lyrics and you got to respect her lyrics because she's been in the world more than we have, you know, well, longer. Yeah, well, whose idea was it for you to go to America? Um, Terry Lawler said like, wanted to get some experience. I had 21 fights, but if I could go around uh, America, it's Vegas, it's Chicago. Um, I even had a fight in America, you know what I mean? But it's to see the feeling and the vibes, what's out there. America's a big place, but there's some weird nutters, but there's some good nutters out there as well. What was that like for you? Were you nervous going out to America alone? Not really. I thought it was quite exciting. Me, Mark Kaler and Tony Adams went over there. Um, good experience. Did you know who Mike Tyson was before you went? No, I don't think Mike Tyson knew who he was. <laughs> <laughs> what, were you, what were you thinking the first time you seen him? Uh, nothing much. He weren't, he's not much more bigger than you, but he's compact. You know, I mean, you're compact, but he's compact, big neck, and start tweeting like he break dancing. <laughs> 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 yeah, that twitch, didn't he? <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, because I spoke to Big uh, Joe. Oh, what's Joe's? Joe Egan. Joe Big Joe Egan. He yeah, says yeah. he went sparring with Mike Tyson as well. Yeah. But when he used to go running, Tyson used to sprint. He used to say, yeah, you do that. You'll tie yourself yeah. out. But when it came to the sparring, he just used to knock people out for fun. Yeah, but you know what I mean? Sometimes he's a very special, very unusual person. I don't think you, you find too many in the world like him. But good luck to him. I think he's trying to rebuild himself and make some more money, but it's not that not that easy, but I wish him well. Yeah, did you feel his power the first time you sparred? Yeah, he felt his power, but I, he felt my power as well, because he was not being foolish or not trying to be flesh. He was brought in to be my sparring partner. We designed to go to, to the Catskill Mountains. Gleason's is the name of the gym. It's a Jewish health farm, but they love boxing and they had a ring built down there solidly for anyone who wanted to come down there. Was there many people there with you? Yeah, there's George, um, a couple of sparring partners and a couple of friends that George brought along. Yeah. And oh, then you... Terry brought along, Terry Lola, sorry. So you made your pro debut at 21? In Chicago, I think, yeah. No, no, no. Um, my pro debut was at Royal Albert Hall. How was that experience? It was very scary, actually, you know? Sometimes when you go into something, um, you've got a television there and you've got uh, 5,000 people in the room. And um, before, when it was the amateur, I leave, there was about, the maximum was about two, 200 people in the room. But it was scary, but persevered through on one different vibe, taking off your shirt, and you've got to fight someone, you know what I mean? Professionally, it's a different cup of tea, and especially when you've got to put food on the table for the, the baby to come and the missus as well. Did you feel that added pressure that you were a father at a young age? No, that's the right cause, you know what I mean? You, you just go with the flow. I wasn't there to really, I was ducking and diving, going to different gyms, sparring, going to different shows and gaining my experience. When did Cass Pennant come into your life? He came into my life when I was about 18. Very, very young, very, you know what I mean, me, at that time, I used to get around on roller skates. May look odd, may sound odd, but yes, I used to ride roller skate for my transport. But one time I went training to Canyon Town, um, I think it was Mile End, these two skinners were the opposite side of me, but they came over the side I was on, but I was minding my own. I didn't even care about what was going on there. I knew they were skinners, and then Kaz came from where he was over, and they went off. But in his book, he sexed it up. I put some VAT on top of it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, he said like, they had knives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Adam says they had guns <laughs> and fucking grenades, mate. Adam says they had everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Tried to sex it up and put it in his book on what he'd done. But I said, Cassie, it worked like that. I was on the scape, minding my own business, nothing. I didn't, I must be very, very stupid 
they was moving close to me, but I, I'm i stupid. I am. That's what my mum calls me. It's very stupid. But sometimes you've got to be stupid to catch smart. So I just minded my own cats come over and they went about their business. But yeah, put it in his book, yeah. Yeah, he's been, he's been a good friend of yours <laughs> oh, through the years. Uh, very, 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 good. very, very, very good. I'm glad I met him over when I'm going to Canyon Town and never stopped being friends as well. Good guy, knowledgeable. Yeah, very well respected as well. Yeah. I feel like Alex Morrison is very respected as well. Yeah, big Alec from Glasgow. He's a good friend Definitely. of my dad's. I knew you were friends with him. He brought Mike Tyson over too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For Hamden fight. Right, yeah. Yeah, big Alec's a good guy. Another man who's well yeah. respected in the boxing industry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah big, big man. His oh, fucking Alex. hands are massive. I know, he makes me laugh, yeah. I can't understand the word he says. <laughs> <laughs> I just nod. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so after your first pro fight then, like your first, uh, your next 21 fights, you, you knocked everyone out. Mm. But w did you feel as if the boxing game was easy at, at that point? No, I never thought it was easy. Never, never thought it was easy at all because sometimes I thought a guy called Jumbo Cummings and I thought he would be easy, but he just come out of prison, had a bullet in him and just took Joe Fraser to, to a draw. So I knew that boxing is a t tough a sport from when I fought him. And he, then he knocked me out in the first round. How I came out for the second and reached this, the seventh round, I knocked him out. God only knows. So for the 21 fights, was there a lot of hype because the British heavyweight division wasn't great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. for a man like yourself coming yeah. through and, and setting it alight, yeah. was there a lot of hype? Or was, did that add the pressure towards it what you were doing? There was a lot of hype, but I'm a guy that minds my own business, man. I don't get involved in people wanting to do this. It's like Lloyd Huntington, Tony Adams, they wanted to do, arrange some sort of like to get together. I just said, listen, I'm, just get me out, keep me out of there business because they're only trying to upset the fans and upset a lot of people you know but I'd, I've done well and kept well and listened to wise people and nick their little bits here and there so after your first loss how did you handle that Frank um sometimes in life you've got to get beaten I handled it pretty well but I went to the gym and try to train a little bit more harder and you know what I mean sharpen up on certain different things see when you lose the do when people you, see when you lose? Do people yeah. actually like? Was people liking the fact that you lost? Because there's always people when you start doing well for yourself. There's always uh, people on the sidelines want you to get beat or want you to fuck up. That's just sad. life. Yeah, it's sad. You know what I mean? They sad the way it goes, but sometimes it gives you more energy, more determination to go forward. Because I like people saying you're no good and insulting me. You can't touch them legally outside of the ring, but if they go inside the ring, I can make up for what certain different ones will say something and. Punish him. You went on a win streak again. You, okay. you went on a win streak after yeah. that. Did you win the European title? Mm. Was it a guy from Sweden? Um, Anders Eklund, about six foot seven, nine. His shoe size was about 17. And his poor wife, small as that, that man down there. You know what I mean? But I was, if you get <laughs> <laughs> well, she must have walked a bit funny, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> if he laid in there, yeah. <laughs> not the stuff in that of her. Yeah, but yeah, I got the bill. <laughs> Before he, she must have been demanding some, you got to give me some loving stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he could have shagged her from outside the room. <laughs> uh, okay. So when you won that title, Frank, that. Was that a dream? Like, did you never, did, nice. you never done the British, did you? And then went to the British. Why? I'd like to have gone to the British, but at the time there was a heavyweight, two heavyweights, Horace Notes and Gary Mason. They were in the same camp, so Terry had to provide and keep them going because they had bills to pay and they're ducking and diving. So it was tricky here and there, but we helped each other, Gary and Horace, as sparring partners. What was it like for you winning a European? It was a nice feeling. But it's not, not as nice as when you won the World Championship, but it's a nice. I didn't, didn't pay much mind, not a lot of people do. That was a European Championship, but yeah, I think it's Anders Eklund, I thought, for that, was it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not even going to pretend I know the name. I just <laughs> know it was a guy from Sweden with Big Yeah, yeah, Anders Eklund. Just call him yeah. Big Feet. And, yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's Anders Eklund yeah. is his name, yeah. In 1989, was that when you fought Tyson? I don't even know what date yeah. is now. No, no, no. If you say so, no, yeah. Mate, yeah, yeah. Because that fight, was that not called off so many times beforehand? Boy, it was scary, man. To even think of it now, it's draining to think how many times it was um, um, postponed. But if you're a boxer, you've got to duck deep, deep, go with the flow. You know what I mean? But yeah, his wife, Robin, I think at the time, did he have a, yeah. a wife? She must have been very sexy in the bedroom. 
talking to him like a puppet. If she said, sit down and bark, he would sit down and bark. I had him under manners. And unfortunately, he didn't he wasn't aware of that because it must have been good sex. That the sex <laughs> blocks everything out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he tried it, having the wife, but you know what I mean? I think she was good for him. Yeah, so that was 1989. Um, you were supposed to get that fight in Wembley. Yeah. But it happened in Vegas. Donald Trump and, and Don King got a briefcase full up with money and gave it to Mickey Duff. And this fight was postponed and moved to Vegas. And I think about five, six times it was um, postponed. Did you want to fight Mike Tyson? So again? Did you want to fight him? Of course. Were you ready at that time? When I knew him when he was 15, I was 19. I knew more than what other people would know. Of course, I wanted to fight him. Do you think it could have made a difference if it was in your home tough oh, Wembley? Much difference, much, much different. How Same we... like when Don King has his um, runners and judges and whatever, gives him a brown envelope, sort something out for them the night before. Yeah. How were but, you treated in America? I was treated pretty well. You know what I mean? Not too bad in America. Yeah, you took thousands of fans came over, did they not, in Vegas? Um, for the first for you, time, yeah. Fight, yeah. The loads of them came over, yeah. What was Don King like? He's not a bad guy. A lot of people can't take him, but he's just a ducker and diver. He's a businessman, very intelligent guy, and someone not to be messed with. So when you go to Vegas, how how long did you go to Vegas for before? Um, about I three. Went to Arizona first to get try and get used to the heat and whatever. So Vegas was about ten days before. And going into that fight. You, you're the first man to ever rock Tyson, is that correct? Well, I think so, if you, you say that. But yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know, I rocked him. He only, you know what I mean? Rock, like, oh, he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? He's getting in the position, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what was that like, going world title fight then, and then losing that? Was that, hard? Was that a bit of pill to swallow? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm determined to fulfill my dream and get where I wanted to do is win the, the WBC Heavyweight Championship belt. But yeah, bad day at the office. Because your friendship with Tyson's became very strong over the years as you've kind of grew closer, is that correct? I think um, knowing him from the Casco Mountains and whatever, getting him by himself, we can talk. He's very, very relaxed, but when he's got them yes people around him, it's very, very difficult to to get through. But I, when we went to Miami, Paul went to Miami with me. He was wasn't too bad. So when you ninety three, when you fought Lennox Lewis, that was you made history. That was the first British heavyweight fight. Yeah, ever. Is it? I didn't know. Yeah, I think so. I don't yeah. know, mate. I've just got that wrong. But as far as I'm aware, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You and Lennox good. Lewis was a, the British. Good title. Good. <laughs> if it's not, we'll just yeah, edit yeah, it out yeah, anyway. Yeah. Twist it up, yeah. <laughs> wicked, yeah. How was the fight between Lennox Lewis and Tyson? Who was who was a harder opponent? I think Tyson, you know what I mean? Very, very awkward. Very difficult to catch. But I think Tyson was on the, the slide then. He was partying too hard. Um, I think Lennox Lewis had got him at the right sort of like time. But if you go back in time, watch DVDs of Mike Tyson when he was in his prime, you know what I mean? The people he knocked out and he's so young, you've got to take that into consideration because not too many... I don't think there's going to be another heavyweight who will come on this earth, how short, and be as dangerous as that man. And I've got to give him respect, you know what I mean? Because he's a dangerous hombre. In the Lennox Lewis fight, you were winning on the scorecards. Yeah. Do you ever feel you, you were just so close as well sometimes in, in some of these big yeah. events? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you get close. That's why sometimes you, you feel like you need to give up, but... Sometimes I don't think I would have lived with myself if I would have given up, because that was my my determination to have my name put on WBC champ Frank Bruno from England. And your fourth time for a world title, you, yeah. you end up uh, right. champion Wembley, oh, packed yeah. arena. How well, how was the feeling before that, Frank? Especially losing three before that, and then going into your fourth. Did you ever feel as if that was never going to be? It was hard, but I had to persevere. You know what I mean. Oliver McCall, I knew him, but he was a very, very dangerous guy in the ranks of whatever ways there were around there. Ray Mercer, um, Larry Holmes, um, Mike Dokes, Greg Page, um, James Critillis, you know what I mean? All names that Greg, all names there were as heavyweights. And I don't, it, you had to be very, very good in that era to get a little touch because Don King was Don King controlling everything so to get a little touch in there is very hard yeah 
So when you won that, what's going through your mind? Can you remember that night? Of course I remember that night. Of course, of course I remember that night. I sweat to bed in the belt, but I was so thirsty to put the belt there and get, get the duty done, you know what I mean? Put the belt <laughs> like you know, I'm like in the mirror looking at the belt. I didn't sleep that night. I was very, very happy, bruised up here and there, but very happy. And at that moment now, that, that's it, all your dreams come true? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Everything you've done in your life was for that moment, to win the world title? Uh, yeah, and to carry on, you know what I mean, being a rich man. How did people treat you after that, Frank? Um, I don't know. People treat me as Frank Bruno, you know what I mean? No different than anyone else. And, yeah, people just treat you as so, I don't, what, in what way would you say? No, because, you're, like I say, you're a legend in the sport, but if, yeah. when you started doing all the adverts and stuff, like, yeah. people were having their little digs and shit. Oh, yeah, I'd done pantomime, they had a dig. I'd done um, ha uh, HP ever. They they, they criticised me for that, but I, I'm a boxer. Terry Lawless always told me this, got to live after boxing, you have something coming in from doing this. So I'd done pantomime, I'd done It's a Knockout, I'd done pantomime for about eight years. It was good fun. Good experience, and especially when the man is dyslexic and you got to read the script. I winged it even when I the last day. I didn't even know what I was saying, but I rang it until I got used to the thing, and I, I had some good shows through Panama. Yeah, so that's the sad thing as well that someday coming from where you've came from to then being champion of the world to then having opportunities to make some money, provide for your family, and yet people have wee digs. This is yeah. the, the thing that's fucking wrong with society, in my yeah, own opinion. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. People see saying. success as a negative, when really yeah. it should be embraced, when really people should be looking at as if he can do it, Positive, I can do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sad that is, yeah, but you put it on the door now. That's how human beings are. I suppose you get some people jealous of what how you're doing, but them making you jealous should give you more strength, more determination to go forward, you know? and to put your fingers up to them or one finger, whatever. Yeah, it's good to do that as well. Yeah. Did that affect you at any point? What's that? Did that affect you that when people started pointing I prod? I really listen to too much people because sometimes I see Joshua fight the other day and he was worried about what the people were telling him before he went into the fight. So I didn't really want to know or get involved. Sometimes I used to like to look at the opponent, but I would train very, very hard, just go in there, touch wood, and go in there and fight. If I do well, I do well. If I don't, I don't. Yeah. Only once you won the world title, the agreement clause was to fight Mike Tyson after that. Yes, um, Frank Warren let me sign that, and Frank Warren didn't let me have Henry Bramman, who came to represent me, to to iron out a good contract. But I can't really talk over sport meal because Frank Warren was watching. He was saying I'm a ungrateful so and so. I'm not ungrateful. I thank him from the bottom of my heart for raising and making that fight with Oliver McCall. But I don't know how a man could be in prison. And then he comes straight on to be number one contender for my belt yesterday. So let that go. Does that play in your mind? That, that you... it don't play in my mind. But these promoters, they're very, very tricky, and I can see why some people get lawyers for their backside. Because sometimes, if they they're trying to tread on your toes, they're trying, you know, mistreat you, and you know, they make a lot of money for most. I didn't realize how much money they made, but that was yesterday, man, and it's going for today. Yeah, so you fight Mike Tyson again. Uh -huh. He's just out of prison. He does it. Did, did you ever feel as if you had you would have the edge then if he was away for a few years? What, in prison? Yeah. Nah, man, they'd be chasing his ass all over the place. <laughs> 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 I bet he couldn't even bend down in the shower or something like that. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I don't know. I, a lot of friends I know are in prison, but I don't know. Yeah, if you, I've been in, I've been in prison to visit friends and whatever, but I don't know what it's like when they shut the door. You know what I mean? And I don't know. I've got lots of friends. But yeah. <laughs> I leave it as that man. Go on to the next question. So that was your last fight, Frank. Was that your last fight against Mike Tyson? Yeah, it was my last fight. Yeah. How was that then? Like amazing it career. Nice. It was sad in a way, but it's not the way I wanted it. But this way the cookie crumbles when I fought Mike Tyson um, for the second time. Uh, I got a detached retina from Oliver McCall in the first fight, in the first round. But I rang it and tried to go through, but it was very risky doing what I'd done. How was the decision for you to give up boxing? It wasn't easy, you know what I mean? But I kept training, trying new things, going, you know what I mean, to do shows and whatever. But yeah, you never take the, the, the buzz as boxing will give you. 
especially if you've had if you've been fighting your whole life and then you've got some direction you've got some purpose like yeah. and that gets took away from you like there's becomes then a big void a void that where you think well fuck me like am mm. i not good enough anymore Do, is that when the negative I think Habit sometimes it plays, plays on your mind certain different things because some boxers haven't fulfilled and got the right money that they really deserve. And that's what a lot of them come for a lot of trouble when they finish from boxing. Do you feel as if you were used at any point? Yeah, I do. But I don't want to have this video saying, oh, he's in the podcast, he's ungrateful. I'm very ungrateful to the bottom of my heart. I can't. There's only so much money you can have. There's only so much money you can chase. And I'm very grateful. You know what I mean? I'm ducking and diving. I'm not as rich as I was when I was uh, married and had the 75 acres or whatever. But it's life, man. As long as I've got a tent, a roof over my head, I'll be grateful. Because you see some people or some countries you, you go to, like Uganda and whatever, and some people, they, they do live in a shell. So I'm just grateful that I can provide for my family and still go on and make a little bit of change. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking. Yeah. That is, that's all you can do is... Be grateful yeah. for the past, learn from the mistakes and try and fucking better yourself from Definitely, them. Man. Do you know what I mean? Like, life is a mad journey, Frank. Like, you, what a career you've had and everything you achieved mm. is, un is unbelievable. And like, even now, telling your story, that people are still intrigued by it, especially right. with the books, which we'll touch on your new book, uh, yeah. 60 Years a Fighter, which uh, we'll leave the link in the description. But for everything you've done is, is brilliant. What was the best moment for you in boxing? Winning the world championship, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, meeting some nice people through boxing. Some people, um, class boxers or gangsters, and no more gangsters than any politicians out there. But yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Scary sometimes here and now, going into the ring with some monsters. You know what I mean? When I mean monsters, some tough guys that they used to be runners and do whatever they got to do. But I did good innings, it's a good laugh. Teach you how to look after yourself and protect yourself and take no bullshit. But yeah, uh, good innings. And after boxing, you've been very big on mental health. You spoke I about very, it very, very frequently. Uh, I think you are probably the, the biggest sports star, well, probably the biggest person in the UK to touch on mental health at that mm. stage because it wasn't really spoke about. If you speak about it, people laugh. People think he's fucking off his nut. But yeah. you were kind of... I was saying the Google people thought I was nut. <laughs> 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 Seriously, he's I lost saying, his shit again, they would have been saying. You know, some of the guys from the Alice and Jim, are you okay, bro? I said, yeah, but okay, what are you doing down here? Yeah, but I've, I can be a human being and keep my feet on the ground and have fun, down, which I did have good fun down in the Gobbles. But we twisted away. What was the question before that? Yeah, you were at the forefront, Frank, when it came out about mental health. It wasn't really spoken about then. Like, yeah. How hard was that? Like, the, especially the newspapers, like, they should be supporting people who are struggling or battling. Like, the front pages was like bonkers, Frank, kind of making a fool of you. Yeah, it was a sad, you know I mean? But Rebecca Wade is a news journalist. She works for Rudolph Murdoch. There's a guy called Andy. Andy used to be an um, editor of the, the News of the World. He lost his job. But I don't know how these people can crucify people, di distract people's lives and think that they can walk around normally. But I took a lot from, from him, but I made a lot of money when I retired because I knew they were saying that I was being paranoid in my own car when my, my car was bugged. They bugged my house. They, they, they done all different things to get a story. And it weren't nice being chased like that, because especially when you know that the people are outside your house and what shouldn't be outside your house. But yeah, I'm happy. So I've had Paul Gascoigne on as well, who's became a good friend, and he was the same. Like, when you hit that height of fame, the only people mm. you can kind of turn to is your close friends and family, but yeah. all, every one of his, every time he was speaking to them, it would be leaked. So he started blaming them and ended up becoming more lonely because he thinks everybody's speaking to turns against him, but it's because yeah. the press were bugging his house, yeah. bugging his... He's yeah, it ain't nice, you know, and living well, your life paranoid that someone's got you under surveillance and watching whatever you do. If you go outside your house and that, there's a car waiting to follow you wherever you go. But yeah, as I say to you, you know, I mean, it weren't nice living that sort of like life for a very long time. But people said I was paranoid. But I'm not paranoid. I'm pretty aware of what's going on. Yeah, because you used to leave uh, bottles of gin at Paul's door, empty Ooh. bottles, press the door. He used to come out, pick them up, put them in the bin, and he used to, the headlines were Paul Gascoigne's drinking again. Powerful, but sometimes you need them to get, make you famous. But the younger, the, er, the earlier days, uh, the journalists were very, very straight up. They, were, they had birds all over the place. Wherever we went to America, we went to Italy or whatever, there were good journalists that you could bounce off one another. But when they bring in the evil choppers and the 
talking about you doing this. What we're not doing no more different than what you you journalists are doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they're they're there following us from the fight all over the world, but they're not. Nothing's been written about them. But they were well, the crucified people. We've had enough of him now. And bury people. It's not nice to sell headlines because yeah, the media definitely. the media do kill people and it's it's a proven fact that what yeah. they've said about people and it's pushed people over the edge because mm. people believe what they read people believe what they watch yeah, I don't really read it no it's that is fish and chip paper isn't it so after that then 2003 you were section Frank what yeah. was it beforehand Was did you know deep down your, your mental health was slipping or it was slipping to a little bit because I got a lot of politics from the kids and the ex-wife and whatever I can't use that as an excuse but it went on for a long time, and a woman's school ain't nice. Were you smoking a lot of weed? Uh, I'm a little bit. That fries your fucking nut. Like, I it smoked depends that what for you get this sensible stuff that make you feel like a professor. Yeah. You must be getting too, too much strong <laughs> I was getting shit grown from the gorbos, Frank. <laughs> I was frying yeah. my fucking nut. Yeah. But yeah. Because we we think that that then becomes the escape. My drink it's drugs. not an escape. It depends what you take, how yeah. you take, and how much you take. You know what I mean? If you go in prison, and you've got a Bob Marley there, you're going to use that like salt, ain't you? And take your time with it, you know what I mean? But some people are hogs. They want to put the whole thing in there. They don't know if they're cold, good, or easy shit, they're flying. <laughs> <laughs> easy shit, they're flying. But if you take your time, man, and get the right sort of stuff, it mellows you out. So in 2003 then, when you get sexting, what was it like in there, Frank? How hard was that for it you? It wasn't nice at all. You know I mean? People coming up to you, challenging you and different things like that. And there's some people need help in there, but I don't think the help what the, the people are giving them, you know what I mean, is any good at all. Just using people like puppets. See, beforehand, did you know deep inside that there was something wrong or did you just think you were fine? From when I was born, I knew there was something wrong. I was always got in trouble, you know what I mean? I didn't, yeah, I was always, from the, being in the family of six, I was the one who always brought drama to the, to the table. I didn't mean it, but I was hanging out with the wrong sort of people and it was exciting. And you know what I mean? The next thing you knew that using the police van coming home. I was dropping me home anyway. Did like Frank what, did day. Frank Warns uh, say that he was going to stay in? The Frank who? Frank who's Frank? Warren. Frank Warren, yeah. Did he say that he was going to stay in with you in two thousand three? After the fight? Yeah. No, 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 I didn't have nothing because he, he moved on to the other fight. When he got shot, Frank he's a nice guy. But he, he's just a, not ruthless, he's just blunt. And I don't blame him for being blunt. Because when you get shot and someone's trying to take your life and you ain't got no choice but to be sharp on the point and don't mess around. So in 2003, was, it, was that when you were diagnosed with bipolar? In 2003? <laughs> I think when I was about, about eight, ten, I was something going wrong in my head. For, you know what I mean? Yeah. From about that age, but it fully coming out might be the date you just said. Because a lot of people don't quite understand it. Everything like this is kind of spoken about now, mental health. Like yeah, 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 like, yeah. There's labels free away everywhere. Everybody goes through it, but some men don't like to admit it. Women can cry, talk about it, get things off their plate, but men, you wouldn't know, like a man like yourself would come in and but maybe having stress and definite bills just coming through. So some men hide it, some can't. <laughs> learn how to hide it you know with pressure do you think that's where it should be dealt with is men speaking up more I think they've got to speak up more you know what I mean there might be all men in this room but if I was to ask them what's going through their head they've got some sort of like drama going on some sort of like Bill was stressing them out but I'm not a clairvoyant or a medium but I'm a double extra large but there's something going <laughs> wrong not something going wrong but some sort of like drama going on in their life and in their head or someone's giving them stress. Of course, man. That's why suicide rate is the highest in men's because it's we don't speak enough. Men, are, I believe, always say this, but men are the sensitive ones. We're totally bottled up, man up. You can handle it. Like, stop fucking crying. Like, and then that's where we suppress all our feelings and emotions. And then 10, 20 years down the line, it comes to head. We don't know why to do, how to deal with it. Doctor. Yes. Dr. James. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. James. So after 2003, what was the steps to getting you back into a normal routine and, and getting fit and healthy? I mean, my trainer Jules said that when you retire from boxing, it's going to be the hardest fight of your life. I didn't quite understand what he said, but it was, you know what I mean? When you're getting divorced and you're going through this and they're trying to get you out of the house and uh, saying you've done this and different as well. But it gave me strength how to be stronger and not take no bullshit. 
no more. But yeah, sad for the kids. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, that's how life goes. Because we touch on mental health as well, but your, was it your coach, George, took his own life? Yeah, he hanged himself. You know what I mean? Sometimes you, you have people around you and that would be the last thing I would have thought. He was old school, brought up tough on the markets and whatever. He was a very, very knowledgeable man, but God rest his soul. How a man could do something like that beyond me. Does that make you question things as well, Frank, when you see somebody who you think would never go down that route, but then you get the phone call to say that he has? Powerful shit, man, when someone brings you. I think his, daughter, his son rang me, and I just dropped the phone. Couldn't believe it, but that's how it goes. So when you started picking up the pieces, did you start getting fit and strong again? Did you start training? Yeah, I trained every day. I, that's, some people might think I'm a nutter, but I trained last night about quarter to 12, got up this morning and trained again. So within them 24 hours, I trained twice. And I wish I would have brought my kit down so I could never see but and saw none, because this is the place I go all the time to some ch chill out. Is that what keeps your demons at bay, Frank? It's nice. The exercise. Too far. Yeah, it does keep me... Yeah, I mean, if I don't exercise, I could be a rotten person to be around. Not rotten, but I like to, you know what I mean, hit the bag and weight circuits and do all different bits and pieces. How much does the punches to the head as well play a part, Frank? I think it does play a part. If it plays a part in football, what do we boxers stand? <laughs> you know what Getting I mean? punched, it yeah. It must do, you know what I mean? But yeah, Muhammad Ali had some form of Parkinson's. They said it was boxing, but... Anybody that tells you punching in the head is good for you, they're not right in their head. It's a very dangerous sport, but it's a sport that us men or gladiators got to come out and make some money for the family and for yourself. That's why I call us gladiators. Seeing so, so it was very well documented about your mental health, did other people come forward and, and speak openly about it also? Yeah, they did. A lot of people come forward, a lot of ladies come forward as well, because you don't know a large wreck with a the shutdown they've had for borderline two years this shutdown with um, Boris, a lot of people are confused, you know what I mean? A lot of people are not happy with them putting on so much weight and they want to lose it and get him back into their routine. But it's a mental thing what a lot of people are going through because some people have, uh, they haven't got spending money or backup money or whatever and they're in pain. What do you do when you're struggling? What do I do? Yeah. Go and hit the bag, man, or go for a long run, chill out, come down the hill farm, go in the, the steamer, Falasso. And you think that's the what keeps you in the balance? Yourself. It is the setting yourself a goal. If you were to run a marathon, if you were a half marathon, you would set yourself a goal and pace yourself. That sort of thing. And it'd be in your mind to keep healthy. It's not easy running 30 miles or a marathon, but set yourself a goal doing something. Do you think there's enough place things in place for boxers, Frank, to help them after boxing? Um, oh, this... I think Barry McGregor was trying to get a house where boxers could go because all the money that boxers made, they took the percentage out a little bit and have a home that any boxer what has been professional or years ago should go into. But that's been, been talked about for a long time. But nobody's come forward in, you know what I mean, getting it going. Because the percentage of money that boxers actually get is, is shocking. Like the money they get for it them. It's not every boxer. Most of them, the Mayweathers and some other Hebrew Jibri guys from America, but not all of them. They're trying to be showmen or whatever, but Mayweather is out there on his own. You look at Tyson Fury as well. He's another one who's spoke very openly about mental health and you see how far he slipped. And to claw that back is unbelievable. That's why I, I class him as one of the greatest all time, not just yeah. inside the ring, but outside. Definitely, but like, definitely, definitely. Your interview with him as well was powerful. Like, I didn't even see it. I was like, no, I hope you, it was all right, but I don't know if, if yeah, you say it's all right. No it was problem. class, man. Like, yeah, to see two strong men, like two guys who were willing to fight anybody on this planet, to then see them unhealthy, weak and battling and then Whoa. speaking openly about it, it's fucking Whoa. powerful. Like, I'm telling you, man, you know what I mean? Women are easy. <laughs> living the realms, you know what I mean? But yeah, he's got about six kids, hasn't he? Tyson Fury. Yeah. But lovely kids they look like, and his wife looks very lovely. And yeah, good luck to him. You always speak highly of Tyson Fury. I've, I've tried to put in people's heads, um, they, that's because he's a gypsy, they don't, they talk bad against him, but I said, take away the gypsy, he is the number one heavyweight. Which, in boxing, can you get fucked three stone heavy than your opponent? If you're supposed to be a, um, a light, a middleweight, you've got a, a weight 11 stone 6 on the button 
a cruiserweight, 13 stone, 13. A, a borderline heavyweight is 14 stone. And he's gone up to nearly 20 stone. How do you think Tyson would be against Mike Tyson? Tyson Fury is a tricky guy and he thinks on his feet and they work out a plan, which I don't think they will fight Tyson for Tyson, Tyson, Mike Tyson. That's, oh shit, I'm blown. They don't think they'll go for the Mike Tyson. History has been made. Tyson has done very, very well. The white um, Tyson Fury has done very, very well. I don't think they will, I could be a very, very shock if it is, because I know Mike Tyson is broke at the moment. It may be happening, but I can't see it. Who do you think, both of them at their prime, who do you think would win? Well, Tyson Fury is in his prime, but I'm a prime mate Tyson. I don't, Tyson Tyson is prime. I don't think, you know what I mean, too many people could have beaten him. You can go against him because he was unique. Watch all these knockouts. They were tough guys. <laughs> the guys of Trevor Burby, he was a good guy. Larry Holmes, he weren't there, you know what I mean? But he's fought Tucker, Bumcrusher Smith. You know what I mean? He fought everybody that was around in the heavyweight division at that time, you know what I mean? And what made, meant the name, he was fearful. See when you see Tyson Fury slipping, see when you see him winning all the belts, undefeated, and then you see him putting on all the weight. Did, you, did that ever remind you of yourself as well? That means he put some weight because he, he's advantage over the opponent. That's why he put some weight. No, but he had his depression when he went up 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah, you yeah. see the telltale signs or did you not know? Yeah, I remember watching him. He had one of them... Um, wigs on and sitting down and just looking at the space you know what i mean and he used to do some odd things you know what i mean go on the binge for certain days and whatever but sometimes a man has strength uh, things going on in their head so i don't know what happened in his private life i wouldn't like to get involved in there but everybody has some form of disturbance in their head yeah, i think it's unbelievable for what he's achieved and he's a, an icon um, and a role model for yeah. people with mental health, including yourself, who speak very openly about it. Your interview with Mike Tyson, when how did that come about when your new documentary last year? They wanted us to, to go over to Miami to do help with the Tyson documentary, but what we had to put things up your nose and square it around and take this Ted the motorbike guy outside waiting to go and deliver it. It's a crazy, but it came out all right in the end. How was it coming face to face with Mike again? It was all right, no hassle. Sometimes with Mike, when he's got the entourage around him, that's where trouble trouble leaks. All the runners, what you know, what I mean, he shouldn't be getting involved with. But getting by himself, he was very constructive. Laughed and he went along with the the flow that everything should go on. Did he have a good conversation off camera? No, no, no. I don't think off the, you're never off camera. Are you? <laughs> 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 never off camera, but yeah, but yeah, he was all right. Yeah, he's 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 there promoting weed now, isn't he? He's a ganja planter. Yeah, he's got the weed farm. Was he smoking when you were there? Um, I did see. I don't know, my lord. <laughs> no. Yeah, he does his podcast and he's eating. Fu he's eating fucking mushrooms and. <laughs> oh yeah, no, nah, that that he's, that is he's a out, bit. He's you know what I mean? Listen, even the smoking to encourage kids to go. You should leave that if you want to do that in, in, indoors. He can do that, but he gets near the mark, you know what I mean, with kids and not near the mark with kids, but they've been known for women, you know what I mean? And you can't, you can be who you want to, but you can't pick out who you want because that's someone's child. But you're trying to explain things to him. He was thinking that he could walk on water and the people around him were, were getting him this, getting him that, and he was out of his box all the time, you know? Yeah, do you do you see that then? Because the boxing in the 90s is what I remember it from yourself, guys yeah. like Mike Tyson, like... And in Vegas, like the money, you, like Tyson was on like 40, 50 million a fight back yeah. then. Like, some fighters don't even get that now. But because when you were agreeing to terms, like you were only getting one third of the purse, is that correct? I don't know one third. All I know that, you know, I mean, it's supposed to be Mike Tyson at the time. He must have got 40 million allegedly. And I was a champion, so I should have got that by beating Oliver McCall. But I don't particularly get into it because. It might wind up Frank or whatever, but if you think that a heavyweight is a champion, he should get the more, more money. Yes, I do. Yeah. I rest my case, you know. Just bad management then at some points, I know. It was a little bit, but Frank would allow Henry Bramwood to come upstairs to draw out a contract with, with me. It's a strange how we just had to sign the con contract and not have, have another lawyer or someone look over it and one and two things, even the money. 
was not as good, but it's money's only money. How do you think, looking back now at your career, Frank, when you talk about it, does it bring back a lot of emotion? Yeah, it does bring a lot of emotion. I had good fun. I met some beautiful people up and down all the way around the world. And yeah, there's certain different things that I'm going to fulfill and go around the world. And yeah, just have a laugh, man. Yeah. Sometimes a laugh is a tonic and it takes off the pressure. But sometimes you, you can't like laugh at all the stress was around yeah. you, but I'll try and keep away. Yeah, because we all know, listen, you've been sectioned a few times, but when you're floating about gorbals, people must have thought your fucking head had really gone. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was weird. <laughs> burns in a, in a banana suit. And they were taking the piss out of me, the Scottish, you know, yeah, you like banana? Yeah, and whatever. And this went, yeah, all right, no problem. This is Glasgow. I'm not saying nothing because sometimes you get a little tribal mark yeah. in your face. So you know, they're only small guys, aren't they? Yeah. The more small <laughs> they are, the more dangerous they are. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, listen, I love Glasgow, but it's fucking wild. Like, how long were you up there for, Frank? I was up there for about two, three weeks. She went to do her hairdressing. I was up on the, the balcony with a piece of wood just trying to get strong. Just the tablets that they're giving me, I didn't know where they were taking me, but they weren't taking me to the right place I wanted to go. <laughs> yeah. That was the experience in the gorbals, and they, I, big man, the big, fit, big man, they would call me or whatever. I had good fun. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing over here? The same thing you're doing, sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's mad. It's fun. About four years I went, went you know, Yeah, it's there. a good place. Loyal, good. Good class, Swedish, Scottish are fucking Very, nuts. very good people, man. What sort of, are you on medication in that now, Frank? The other medication, um, I'm not too sure, it's called a uh, depot in your backside. Google it, man, you know, it's ending like a zombie. And does that make you f go through the day okay? Um, yeah, I'll get through the day okay. I'll get, I've got no problem, I don't need nothing. An injection in my ass to get through the day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that, not at all. For anybody that's watching, Frank, that's maybe struggling with mental health and yeah. doesn't really see a way out, what advice would you have for them? The first thing to do is talk to somebody, get it off your plate or hunt for somebody that could help you. There's a lot of different charities where people are getting involved with that you can dial them up and they would talk to you, advise you where to go. Even the Frank Bruno Foundation, they've got people going on doing them things, but we're not quite there yet because we've got to tidy up and get the right sort of like stuff. Yeah, it's a great foundation. I spoke to a big, big Martin Ford. He's a big, big oh, that guy. big. Yeah. I see him the other day doing boxing. He was, um, he, he looks pretty good, yeah. very flexible. I spoke to him last night, he was asking for you, was it? Yeah, yeah, wicked. Now he's very, very, I thought, big lump, but I see him there, he was in front of the mirror, and he's very acrobatic. He was, yeah, rolling all over the floor like a nut, yeah, 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 wicked. yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, very, I'm yeah, glad he's, he's involved with the charity, you know, yeah, he's got a fight coming up. Uh, well, and April, fight. he's fighting a guy called the Hulk, the Iranian Hulk or something. Okay. It's the biggest heavyweight fight of all time, I think. Is it? Yeah, like both 20 odd stone. No, but I, there's something odd. You know what I mean? The 20 odd stone, it should be about 16 stone yeah, or I think. 15 stone. But the, the, the sweet, the sweeties, yeah. allegedly, is overtaking his body because he's that mad. big. He's big old lump, isn't he? Yeah, they're massive. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck to him. So, all your life, Frank, let us say, you've had an amazing career. It's unbelievable what you've achieved. Yeah. Six books. How was it writing this book? It was good. You know, Nick Owen is a very, very good writer and a very, very good man. And I just wanted to, everybody else is write, writing a book. So, why well, can't I not write the book or dictate to let them write what's in the book? But yeah, it's good to read. Does it get tiring, Frank, like talking about your past and bringing it up? No, it don't get tiring. Sometimes the person, people don't know you or they don't know what you do or think they know what you do. It's difficult to explain them what you've done over the years. But I've done so many different things. I've got half of the things what I, I'm doing. And I think I haven't finished my chapter in my life yet. There's a lot of different things that I want to do. And I think I will to do and follow it up if I take my time. Would you ever have an exhibition for you? There was talk about that the other day. Bo was looking about an exhibition fight. But if you go one exhibition fight, you've got to fight another exhibition fight and you got to get some gangsters to promote the, the, the fight or whatever. I don't know. If, I, if it was right, I wouldn't turn it away. Because everybody, I think I'm in better shape than a lot of them there, um, to be quite honest. But if the money was right, I would take it. What's your plans for the future, Frank? Just try to be happy. And this this is your life, man. I come down here quite a lot of the time when I'm, I live about 15, 20 minutes away, but uh, perjuries have looked after me very, very well. When I got divorced, I stayed down there for seven years. 
and free of charge or whatever. So sometimes when I'm feeling down at home, just come in and chill out and just walk around. And they've got a lot of facilities where you can do. What about uh, British boxing now, Frank? Do you, is there anybody that's caught I your think eye? A lot of them are catching my eye. There's a lot of them coming out in the cruiserweights and the heavyweights. It's going to be a bit confusing and, and light heavyweight. That, that era and borderline middleweight and moving up is a very, very good era. And you see some good boxers, hungry belly guys want to do well for themselves. Yeah, well, you and Lennox Lewis kind of had the blueprint for yeah. heavyweight boxing. Now you've got uh, Joshua, you've got yeah. Tyson Fury, like this. Mm. British boxing's thriving just now. Scott, my Scottish guy, Josh Taylor as well. On this is that the heavyweight? No, he's a uh, lightweight. I see a heavyweight with a Scottish flag on. Is that, you got another, a white, big man, man he was. Probably has, but I don't know, man. Don't know, uh, no, I just no, know no, Josh Taylor. He, just, he won all the belts. He's, he's Who? flat. Josh Taylor. Oh, yeah, yeah, Scottish. yeah. Scottish. Yeah. Unbelievable. Is he Scottish? Yeah, yeah unbelievable. Yeah, There's Josh Taylor and there's another Josh. Josh, who's... Josh Warrington? He may be one of the Leeds. Joshies or whatever. He's from Sunderland. Leeds? No, no, he's from Sunderland, the boxer. Josh. Kelly. Josh Kelly? Kelly, he's from Sunderland. Yeah. Yeah, good, good, nice. But I think if, if I saw him fight, his last um, fight last last time he fought, he, went, he needs strength in his body. He's got a lot of skill. But when he's fighting big, bigger name guys, he needs that a little bit more strengthen his body, you know what I mean? But yeah, if I see him, I try and put that to him because he's got all the skills under, under the earth. See, when you watch boxing, Frank, does it make you excited? Does it make you sad that you can't do it? Like you're not doing no, it? No, sad. I think sometimes when you've been in boxing, it's very, very nerve-wracking, a low place, but you're always a lot by yourself or whatever. I'm just glad I finished it. It's not an easy game to put your mind through, put your mind, body through or whatever. So I've done what I had to do, but... If some of these heavyweights and want to do an exhibition, it's a money's right, I would take it. Who would you fight? Who? Who would you like to fight? Any one of them. <laughs> yes. Any one of them. Yeah, fair fucking play. Like. Yeah, but, you know I mean? Under, uh, to be quite honest, if I were to fight them, I would put them under my rules because them guys are very tricky, you know? And they've been doing this, uh, um, whatever they're doing for years. They know about allegedly tablets to take or what to take because... Holyfield got beaten the other day. He got knocked out or beaten in the first round. That, that, I never would have heard of that in a million years. But I would like to just, if they come up to me, I've got some things for them anyway. Yeah, Exclusive. I've seen that fight, man. That was sad to watch, What's though. That? The Holyfield fight. Yeah. I watched it, man. I didn't yeah. like that, what I was seeing. I Weird, think, isn't it? Yeah. And it still was a comeback. Would you believe that? Why do you think that is, Frank? Because there's something Money. missing? Money. Money. Mike Tyson is coming back because he's broke. He needs money. And I'm not saying that behind his back. He will tell you, if you look at his thing, he's he's broke. For anybody watching who's in boxing, involved in boxing, what yeah. advice would you give for them, Frank? Look after yourself. Look after the pennies. And, you know what I mean? Try and enjoy this very, very tough game. Try and be fit and make as much money and be like a screw, as George Franz used to say. Make a screw put a little bit here and there because it's short lip, um, life boxing Frank for coming on today brother cheers telling you. your story Mr. thoroughly enjoyed that no problem absolute legend cheers would you like to finish up on anything no boss whatever <laughs> <laughs> <You're Yeah. missing. laughs> listen god bless you Frank cheers, I'll leave boss. the link for all the descriptions for the book uh, get, make sure you get the book and take care and I look forward Respect, to seeing boss. you cheers. if you have a fight for the Thank future you. Respect, boss. take care brother nice one cheers